John chapter 4. <clears throat> A couple things that we'll remind you of in prayer a little bit later on. Uh, Sister Rose, our wonderful secretary, um, been working here, actually she's been working here longer than I have. Um, she is, uh, she had a um, <clears throat> cardiac catheter <clears throat> done earlier in the week. And um, if you remember a couple weeks ago, uh, she had a, a mild heart attack. And uh, so they brought her in for a cardiac cath on Monday and um, found out that she's got blockage. Let's see if I can find that. Uh, it's like in one artery was 100%. And, um, and some, of the art, some of the other arteries, it was more than that. S or a little bit less. Than, it can't be more than 100%. It was a little bit less than that. But that's, that's pretty bad. That's pretty, pretty dangerous. They've kept her uh, in the hospital uh, since they did that cardiac cath. They were hoping to do surgery today, <clears throat> but they um, did some blood tests. She has been apparently on a blood thinner, and her blood's too thin, so they were going to hold off till tomorrow. Well, we found out they can't do it tomorrow either. The tests show that her blood still is not where they want it to be, so they're going to hold it off until Friday and do the surgery Friday. She is going to be in the hospital for a few days, um, and then uh, she is to be uh, resting at home off of her feet, off of your feet, Rose, because she's watching. Everybody here, vote I, that Rose stays off of her feet two months, okay? We're not giving your chair away to anybody it's, or your pew. It's still here. And um, then, then this week, we started counting up all the things that Rose does. And see, this is, you young people, work smart. Don't work hard, work smart. Figure out something to be good at that nobody else is and they can never get rid of you, okay? When I was, when I was a house painter, JR, um, two things I was really good at. Number one was masking off, you know, with the tape and the plastic on the windows and everything like that. Even when the windows would be full of condensation because it'd be cold outside and we, we had the house warmed on the inside with these propane heaters, I could get the tape to stick when Sterling and Steve, neither one of them could get it to stick. And they would be throwing the stuff down and you could hear cursing through that, not from Sterling, but from Steve. And I'd say, I'll get it. Well, I could do it. I could make it stick and they couldn't. I don't know why. I just did it. Then we did a, a process. Uh, you don't see it so much anymore, but it was a, we add this mixture to the paint to give it a sandy grit texture. And we have this big, wide block brush. It's about this wide. And you swirl the paint and swirl the sand pattern into it. And they found out that I could reach the ceiling from the floor. The other two guys, they had to put on stilts and do it. And so I was the only one who could, I could do this all day long and did. So I got better at that than anybody else. And so when it came time, I still had a job. So we figured out we're making a list of things that nobody here knows how to do it, that Rose does. So, Rose, we need you back, but we need you back well. Amen? So take your time, but hurry up, all right? So remember her in your prayers. And we have some others. Remember to pray for Graceland. She's at Children's Hospital. Uh, her and Paige 
and they are going to put the NG tube. It's in? The NG tube is in. Okay. Okay, that's what it was. Okay. So um, right now they've got a tube going up here down into her stomach for nourishment, but they're going to make a permanent one going in here. And um, because her body just isn't getting nourished. And I've, listen, I've been with her all day feeding her french fries and little hamburger pieces and everything I could think of. And of course, you know, some of the doctors, they, they take one look at some people and think, oh, they're abusing these kids and they're not treating them right and so on. That makes me angry. But anyway, um, so pray for little Graceland. Uh, we've got some other folk that are sick, so lift them up. And we'll go through the list here in a little bit. John chapter 4, if you have your Bible, handy. If you don't, somebody handy you one. Um, this is, we're going to move from John 4 into John 5 tonight. And um, we'll just kind of take this a verse at a time. Uh, let's read, uh, start at verse 39. The story is, you know, Jesus met the woman at the well, and he tells her that I have water that you know not of. And when she talks about this water, asks about this water, he said, if you drink of this water, you shall never thirst again. And that's true. And it's not that we never have to read the Bible anymore. It's not that we never have to pray anymore. It's not that we never have to go to church anymore. Once you drink of that water, uh, you, you, are, you, you don't get saved twice, is what that means. And if you drink of this water and really partake of it, you won't be dissatisfied and go looking for another religion, even though some people do. To me, obviously, their, their tasting of what God had to offer, um, I, I don't know what happens to some people. Uh, I, I knew of a guy that was a deacon in a fundamental Baptist church, and then he often decides he's going to be a Roman Catholic priest and leaves and joins. And they give him a special sort of unction as a lay priest because he was married and to be part of the orders of the Catholic Church. And ob obviously that guy, to him, Christ just never tasted right. Some people's tastes are messed up. Amen? But that's what that means. The woman goes into the town. She tells everybody, I found the Messiah. Surely he is because he's told me everything I've ever done in my life. And so here's what happened. John chapter 4, verse 39. Many of the Samaritans, I want you to get a hold of this text. I believe that there are still a lot of people out there who desire to be saved. They just don't know where to turn, where to go, and the devil doesn't make it easy on them. He has filled this world with so much garbage, so much false doctrine, so much false Christianity. He's filled it with so much other religions and things like that, that people, it's literally like wading through things to get what you want. Uh, but once they meet the real Jesus, I'm telling you, the more than likely they're going to stay with it. So I believe many of the Samaritans are still out there. Uh, many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. And this is the kind of people that truly want to be saved. They're not, they're not like the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't want John really preaching what John was preaching because they were afraid of John. They were afraid that John was going to start preaching their specific sins and exposing them for what they really were. You remember when they brought the woman caught in adultery to Jesus? And the, the big question has always been, where was the guy she was with? They let him out the back door. Well, they grabbed the woman and was going to expose her. Why? Because I think, more than likely, some of those guys that tossed her out there had been with her and found it convenient 
to have her stoned and killed so she couldn't talk. That's happened, by the way. I believe that's happened. If you remember, if you look up the DC madam on the internet, there was a, a lady, Pelfrey was her last name, and she was a, she ran a high class escort service in Washington, D.C., and she, her little black book had names of people in it that you've heard on the news. And all of a sudden, they find her hanging, hanging, dead, when she said in an interview three days before, I'm not planning on committing suicide. Uh-uh, I don't buy it. So anyway, that, real, that stuff really happened. But here you have people who, upon when they hear that there's a man who's, who can tell them Everything that they've done, they go running to him. They want this in your life. They tell Jesus, tell us what we're doing wrong. Show us the way of eternal life. And so, which testified, verse 40, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And he wasn't just sitting there, not doing anything, eating their food. He's teaching them. He's preaching to them. He's showing them the kingdom of God. He's showing them the doctrines. He's probably giving them the parables that he's taught the other disciples and maybe giving them the understanding of those parables. More than likely, he's telling them about how he's going to be taken and how he's going to be slain on the cross and crucified. But don't worry, he's going to rise again on the third day. I believe he's telling them the gospel. And verse 41, he did this for two days. And watch this. Many more believed because of his own word. And he said, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would bless uh, this message tonight. Father, bless your word, opening our eyes to us tonight. Father, may I step aside and you step forward and open this book to these people and their understanding. And after all, Father, that's what the Samaritans found out. That yes, they listened to the Samaritan woman, but who they wanted to really hear from was Jesus. Father, bless that. Bless the word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. But notice that, that's what jumped out at me as I was going back over this again today, is that when the Samaritans in town heard from the woman, now remember, a woman is always going to be a type or a picture of a church. Um, could be this church, could be any decent church, any church that wants to know the real Jesus and that will not be ashamed to proclaim boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the problems that we have now is we have too many churches ashamed that they're Christians. And they want to cater to the world. They want to cater to other religions and say, let's join with them and let's not offend anybody. Let's take down all the crosses that we have. We don't want to offend anybody. Listen, if you're offended by the cross, the Bible's got a verse for you. Okay? The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And to the Jews, the cross was an offense because it was a Roman form of, of Suffering is a Roman death, and, and they didn't like it. But Christ's cross, they don't like it either. So here the woman, she goes and tells everybody in town, and it would be like this church or anybody in this church or anybody you folks online associated with this church helping to spread, not me, not Bethel Church, but the word of God that we preach here. And some of you, you've been blessed because other people have come in and you've seen it. You said, hey, I just talked to this guy about this guy, Mike Hogger in Bethel Church and, and passed on some of his sermons to him. And boy, they, they really like it. Now, boy, they're hooked in and they got a King James Bible. That's what I'm waiting to hear is that they did that. And that's what happened with the people of the Samaritans in that town. They came and many more believed because of his own word. If I were, and this was me a long time ago, I was trying to make it about me. Did I do a good job preaching the sermon? Did, and I found myself really gauging my own worth 
on whether or not people came up to me and said, Pastor, I loved, I loved that sermon, I enjoyed that, or how many people I could get to the altar at an altar call. I found myself judging myself based upon that, which is, and finally God helped me with that and helped me to see and understand, Mike, it's not about what you can get them with, their, with an emotional response down to the altar today. It's what's going to happen with them five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years. What's, where are they going to spend eternity at, Mike? That's what matters. And so you can pray right where you are. You can pray down here. You can go home and, and try to forget about everything I said. And then two days later, it hits you. And God really drives it home. And I've heard testimonies of that too. But it's about those who want not just what I have to say, but they want what the word of God has to say. And they'll believe that. They won't have a problem believing that. They'll believe it instantly. In verse 42, and said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of thy saying. And again, this church cannot proclaim to you that you're saved or you're not saved. It is not by our proclamation. It is not by our membership. We are going to baptize a couple of people for our homecoming this year. One who's coming from uh, quite a few miles away, and one of them is here, Derek. And I've made sure to talk to both of these people, young men, so that they understand you're not saved by coming to Bethel and getting baptized in our water. I want you to understand that. Our church cannot save you. My baptism cannot save you. My preaching cannot save you. It must be the word of God. It must be Jesus Christ or it's nothing. And that's what they recognize. Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now, it doesn't say up in verse 39 how many. It just says many. And I was thinking about this for church. I wonder how many. How many people who lived in this town of Samaria are we going to meet in heaven one of these? Because they're up there now. See, they believed. They got saved, didn't they? They got saved the freshest way you can. Okay? From the real Messiah standing right there in front of them. That's as bad as... Actually, believe it or not, your salvation's better than that. And I'll tell you why. Wouldn't it have been neat to watch the Red Sea actually op open up in front of your eyes? Wouldn't that be cool? You're an angry Jew, right? And you're about ready to rebel against Moses and God. And all of a sudden, Moses throws his rod over the Red Sea and the water parts. And all of a sudden, now you're a happy Jew. Okay? Wouldn't that be awesome to see that? What did Jesus say to Thomas? Blessed art thou because thou hast seen and believed. Yea, Ray, rather more blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. I've never seen Jesus, never met him personally, face to face. But I've read about him and I believe every word about him. And in that sense, because of what Jesus said, our salvation is actually, I wouldn't say better, I don't know the word I would use, but actually we're better off because we didn't see these miracles with our own eyes. We didn't see Jesus rise from the dead, but we read about it and we believe the word that got the record. That's John's favorite word, bear record. We believed the record that God left us here on this earth of the things that were done 2,000 years ago. And if you were to take this Bible and go over here to Jefferson College or go up to University of Missouri, St. Louis, or even go to St. Louis University, which is supposed to be a Catholic university, and start asking those professors, do you believe the words that are in this book? They'll laugh and they'll say, no, we don't believe the Bible. We're atheists here. What are you? This is Catholic University. We're atheists. <laughs> okay? Right? That, how, how do you know that happened? That was 2,000 years ago, and history you know, has to be rewritten all the time. And No, I believe it. I wasn't there, but I still believe it. And I can tell, I'm telling you, God will bless you more 
than even Jesus blessing those Samaritans who got saved that day. But that's one thing I wanted to point out to you is those Samaritans, they're in heaven now. They've been waiting for us. Okay, they've been waiting for us. We're going to get to meet them one of these days. And that woman who was there, we're not giving her name. I think we'll know her. Amen. I think we'll know her. Now look at verse 43. Now after two days, uh, pay attention to, to days, dates. Um, a day with the Lord is what? That's a thousand years. Peter said that as one witness. David said in the Psalms, a thousand years are in thy sight as but yesterday. So you have two witnesses from the Bible telling you that a day could either be 24 hours and or a thousand years, both of them. And I'll give you an example of, of how that works. If you remember, God told Adam, Genesis chapter 2, concerning the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. Well, on the day that Adam ate of that tree, he didn't die. Now, some say, well, he died spiritually. Well, I don't really read that verse. So there has to be, God's not a liar. But we do have to follow God's rules on how he speaks. And if you notice, Methuselah was the oldest in the Bible, 969 years. No one lived older than 969 years. Adam died at 930 years. You have some who are a little bit older, some who are a little bit younger than Adam. The, the young guys, those that didn't make it to quite 910. Okay, the youngsters. But notice that after Adam, no one lived to be a thousand years. Why? Because God meant what he said in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. And no one lived to be a thousand to fulfill the day. So that's how God meant it. That's what I believe. So he gives these, uh, today in my program today, I mentioned in, in Exodus 19, how God, when he's meeting with Israel, he tells Moses, tell the Israelites that to get ready for two days and then on the third day, come and present yourself. So think about it. It's been about 2,000 years. We're getting into the years. We're, we're past the birth of Christ. So we're getting into the years of the death of Christ somewhere around. They say he died probably somewhere around A.D. 30, 31, somewhere around in there. It wasn't A.D. 33. We already know that. We don't know quite the year is, is what I'm saying. But we're getting up to that time. And so it's been almost 2,000 years, two days. So the third day, if it lasts 1,000 years, which it will, will be the 1,000-year reign of Christ. And that is called in your Bible the day of the Lord. Some people look at the phrase, the day of the Lord, and say, it, well, it all has to happen that day. That's the day of the Lord, because it's got to happen in that day. Well, part of it will on this one 24-hour day. But then after that, he's got a thousand years to do the rest of what the Bible says he's going to do at the day of the Lord. So I think that's what it means. So now after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. Remember, Galilee was where he's from. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again unto Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. That's where he did his first miracle. Now watch this. He's about to do his second one. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down 
and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. And I can, I can sympathize with that man. Having had loved ones at the point of death besought Jesus that he would come and heal his son. Him thinking that Jesus had to travel and physically come to his house and do something in order to heal his son. But does Jesus actually have to go here to do it? No, he's God. He can be anywhere he wants or everywhere that he wants all at one time. And he doesn't actually need to be in the same room, in the same house, or in the same country in order for him to heal. He can do it anywhere. So, verse 48, Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Now, let me address this just for a few minutes. I, I brought up Gideon Sunday morning. And, and I'm going to do it probably again this Sunday morning. Um, we're dealing with prayer. And with prayer, there is an aspect of prayer where God teaches us to wait on Him and trust Him. I'll never forget that morning that I woke up one morning, the Holy Ghost was sitting there and and as soon as I woke up, God said, Mike, do you trust me? And I was going to lie and say, God, you know I trust you. And God said, you don't. You think that your way is the only way that I can do what you want me to do. Mike, I can do what you want me to do at any time and in any way I feel like it. I can answer your prayer any day that I want to and any way that I want to. But Mike, you think that it should be done your way. And I want you to get out of that idea and get out of it real quick and just let me do what I want to do. And I'll promise you I'll be good to you. And I re before I ever got out of bed, I was repenting of the sin of not trusting God because I thought it had to be done my way and in my time. And that particular situation, I am still waiting on the Lord. I still am. He has not yet answered that prayer that I was praying at that time. He has not yet answered that prayer. And that's been, quite, that's been many years ago. And I've re-prayed the prayer, reminding God. God didn't forget the first one I prayed. And so I have to trust God that He is going to do what He promised that He was going to do. That's what hope is. Hope is the well-grounded knowledge in knowing that God will do what God said He will do. He will, His Word will not fail, ever. And so, now after, um, verse 47, when he had heard that Jesus has come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him, besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Jesus said to him, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And here's what I was going to say. It's not wrong to ask God to give a sign. It's not wrong. I've done it before. Um, a lot of examples, probably most of them are just private. I don't want to give them. I remember one night I was at a revival service and something was heavy on my heart and I was very troubled. I didn't really go down to the altar, I, but I just stood there and prayed, God, would you do this for me tonight? And that night God did it. And it was, a, it was a sign that God had heard my prayer 
and that God was going to bless my prayer and answer my prayer. And I got the sign that night. I got confirmation that night. Gideon, as we'll probably look at Sunday, and the whole story about the fleas. Gideon was a man who always had to be reassured by God of just about everything God said to him. He wanted a double witness and a triple witness. And God, are you sure you got the right guy? And God, I mean, that's Gideon. That's probably most of us. We're very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Where uh, we don't trust a lot of people or we don't, we don't have a lot of confidence. Okay? There's nothing wrong in seeking signs. And there's nothing wrong with asking God to show a sign or leave a token. I was talking about this today. The rainbow is a token that God gave us. It's like God signing a contract. Uh, when they say, in fact, the word sign, when they say here, sign this, think of what the word we're using. Sign. Uh, did he sign that? Did he put his mark on that? Did he show us that he is going to honor and keep that contract? Well, if there's a blank spot there and you didn't sign it, that means you're not, gonna, you're not obligated to fulfill the contract. But if you put your sign on there, that means that you're going to honor the agreement. You're part of the contract now. Does that make sense? God signs things differently. He signed the covenant that he made in Genesis 9 not to flood the world with water anymore with the rainbow. And every time we see a rainbow, that's God's signature. Okay? And God signs the, the sign that Abraham was justified by faith, the sign of that was circumcision. And the Jews to this day follow that. So God signs different things different ways, and God, that's God's way of sealing it. The covenant that we're under now is the new covenant, and in Ephesians tells us that God gives us the earnest that the Holy Ghost is in us. God is showing us that he's going to keep his promise to us by giving us of his Holy Spirit. And boy, he gave it enough of it. Amen? You believe this book, that means that you have the Spirit of God in you, the Spirit of faith abiding in you, and you believe this book. And that's a sign that God gave us. So there's nothing wrong in itself with Asking God for a sign, especially when we need help. God understands that we don't see what he sees. However, Jesus then warned later on about a wicked and an adulterous generation that demands and always seeketh after a sign. That's what you got to be careful for. Because that's when the Benny Hens and the Kenneth Copelands and all these other quacks and clowns come in, do these absolute pretended signs and wonders. I read a series of articles the other night about, I've talked on this before, about the Pensacola outpouring. It was a, believe it or not, it was a five-year-long revival service. Happened at the Brownsville Assembly of God. It started out with them inviting an evangelist, Stephen Hill, to preach on a Sunday morning, Father's Day. And supposedly the Holy Ghost broke out. People were slain in the Spirit everywhere. People were just falling down everywhere, crying. People were getting holy laughter. And then every, I mean, every night for five years, Stephen Hill stayed at this church preaching services every night. And they had people coming literally from around the world to this thing. And the local newspaper ran an investigative report about this church. I'd never seen this before until last night. What's the root of all evil? Love of money. Church wasn't doing so well and the pastor was about ready to quit. And the paper said that it looks to them like they orchestrated this because the first service they had didn't go so well. But they hyped it. And all of a sudden now, they're having these miracles done all over the place. 
And then all of a sudden, people start getting word of it. People start coming in from around the world. And money starts, I'm talking, they had a $7 million a year budget. Money rolling in. Pastor all of a sudden has got a new house. Okay? That kind of stuff going on. False signs and wonders. See, if you live under that rule, then you'll demand signs and wonders or you won't believe it's of God. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous. So he said, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So now verse 51. And as he was going, as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he him, them of the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. Jesus didn't even have to go there. But, but on what basis then? Did he lay hands on the boy? No, he didn't have to. Did he, did he say mumbo jumbo, hocus pocus, alakazam, and sprinkle fairy dust? And No, he didn't have to do that. It was the faith of that man that just believed that Jesus could heal. There was a Roman soldier, same thing with Jesus. Jesus said, I'll come to your house. And the soldier said, I'm not worthy that you come into my house. Just speak the word and it shall be done. And he said, thy faith hath made thy daughter whole. Okay? It's faith, people. Amen? Amen. This is uh, verse 54. This is, again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. So the first two miracles were done in the exact same place. Jesus being there. Now, John chapter 5. There was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now here's what's interesting. If you look in the NIV, most of this story is taken completely out. And I'll tell you what part. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Now, starting at verse 4, they took this out of the modern Bibles. New American Standard, NIV, uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible, every modern Bible, they took this part out. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. They take that whole verse completely out. Now, who in here has a problem believing that part? I don't. God uses the ministry of angels to do his work for him. You know, does he have to? No. But he chooses to, just like he chooses to use you and I for his work. God doesn't have to. He doesn't need us. But he chooses to use us to make us part of his kingdom. And I believe that at a certain time, a certain season, an angel would come down, stir the water, trouble the water, and whosoever was let down into the water first was then healed of whatever disease they had. These people lived there and they knew it. They were counting on it. And then if you take verse 4 out, you have the pool at Bethesda, verse 3, and these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. And you skip to verse 5, it doesn't make sense. The story's empty. It has a hole in it. And you don't know why they're there. You put verse 4 back in, now it makes sense. And I believe it should be there. I believe it is there. I believe it's right. And a certain man was there 
But here's, here's one of the things I think Jesus is doing here. If you read Hebrews chapter 1, you'll see how God contrasts His only begotten Son from the angels of heaven. At, any, at which time did God say to the angels, this is my, thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. No time did God say that to any of the angels, including Lucifer. Never said it to them. So I think... Here, Christ is establishing his ministry is better. Because even though you have an angel stirring up the water, someone with a lot of these people have to be picked up and put into the water. And then, they're, then who gets in there first? Whoever got there first. And I'm sure there was fights every time that happened. And a lot of people let down because they couldn't make it to the water. And that's who this man was. He said, I'm there. I've seen the angel trouble the water. I just can't get to the water in time. So I think, if anything else, Christ is establishing that his ministry is better than that of the angels. It doesn't require whoever can get there first. Somebody say amen. So a certain man was there, verse 5, and which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. When Jesus saw him lie, that's a long time to be waiting at that pool. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Would thou be made whole? And the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise up, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Now, I don't have time to, to teach you the, the rest of this tonight, so I'm going to save that. But I want you to ask the question, Did the man sin by picking up his bed on the Sabbath day and walking home with it. Did he commit a sin by transgressing the Sabbath day? Did he? You're shaking your head no. Prove it, Jack. Smarty pants. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you the answer is no. But we'll learn next week Wednesday, why the Jews were having such a fit of rage bowel movement over this. Why they were so mad that flames were shooting out of their eye sockets. Okay? I'll show you why they did that. It's, it's pretty interesting. What had already developed in Judaism by the time Jesus... This is why Jesus could not stand. This is why Jesus called the leaders of Israel, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. When you proselyte somebody and make them a disciple of you, you've made them twofold more a child of hell than they were. And I'll show you why uh, next Wednesday. It's, it's pretty interesting. But I want you to ask the question, because this is important. Somebody asked me today, did I think the Seventh-day Adventist movement was a cult? And I said, absolutely I do. You people in Kenya, listen to me. Absolutely, it is a cult. And I may get into that next Wednesday too. Because they make the Sabbath day the only day to worship. And that is not what God said. It's what an angel told a woman. But it's not what God said. Amen.